Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. We're going to go ahead and get started with the session today. Thank you so much. I'm just going to turn it over to our moderator, Ross. Thanks, Ross. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for joining us this morning to talk about uh, a world of work which is in flux. Um, I'm delighted this morning to be joined by uh, Marina Gorbis, the Executive Director at the Institute for the Future on my left, and then uh, Dina El Mofti, CEO of Injaz in Egypt, to be joined by Fazil Wamalwa, I got that right, uh, the founder of MSOMA in Kenya, and by Marwa Moaz, uh, the COO of Bamiyan Media Group, again in Egypt. Could I just ask please that everyone uh, switches off their mobile phones. Um, when we get to questions, and we're gonna try to get the questions quite quickly so that we can make this uh, interactive, um, Please do wait until you've got the microphone so that the camera can pick up uh, your question. Um, and at the end, uh, please do remind me to remind you to fill in the survey, please. Something that I'm often not very good at, but is important for our organizers. So um, anyway, <coughs> welcome. And I thought just to get us moving, and in a moment I'm going to ask uh, Marina uh, to talk a little bit, a bit about the future of work, I thought it's probably important for us just to take a few moments to reflect on the context of work. This idea that uh, was raised yesterday of fault lines and this uh, particular idea that, of course, work is something that doesn't exist in a vacuum but that exists in a world that is now defined by fault lines, by uh, widening fault lines in many cases. Uh, a world which is now defined by accelerating volatility and complexity and hyper-connectivity, a world in which those forces are made ever more powerful by massive population growth and massive migration and urbanization and technological advancement. And this is a world in which economies around the world are under great strain and under great uh, transition, moving towards gig economies. Uh, there is a need, uh, there's a shifting of the center of gravity in economies, south and east, globally. Um, there is a need, of course, to shift economies so that they become more, uh, so that we become more sustainable and thrivable. Circular economies are being talked about increasingly uh, as opposed to the classical uh, linear economy which is very costly on the planet and on societies. These are economies in which organizations are starting to shift massively. Employers are moving away from classical hierarchical structures to uh, team of teams, fluid uh, structures. And of course within that the nature of work is shifting. We have massive unemployment and underemployment and misemployment in many places. There is a desperate need and a shift towards self-employment and a need for other employment. So entrepreneurialism is desperately needed in many places. And that's all against a backdrop in which people around the world are raising their aspirations and want to find purpose and meaning in work. So there's something here, I think, about the quality of work in these shifting economies, in a shifting world. So I think that's the context, and I'm wondering if we might just start the conversation moving. If you could, uh, if you're able to, uh, turn to your neighbor and see if you can agree in two minutes on the most important question we should be seeking to answer in this subject of the shifting world of work. The most important question we should be seeking to answer. In two minutes, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, we're not going to take your questions. That's the tease. We will come back to your questions. Just hold 
that question for a while and we're going to revisit that. But for now, let's, I'd love to invite uh, Marina to give us some insights into the future of work. Great. Um, thank you so much. It's great to be here. Let me see if my, if my, with my crystal ball, I can sort of guess that what you thought the most important question is. But let me ask you, I'm not sure that that's the one. I don't have a crystal ball. But let me ask you, raise your hand if you believe that in the next 10 years, technologies, automation, robotics, AI, are going to destroy lots of jobs. Wow. OK, raise your hand, minority of you, who believe that automation and technologies are going to create more jobs. Oh, that's good. You're about you, uh, a little bit. This is pretty much represents the opinions of experts who have been looking at this for a long, long time. Some of them truly believe that technologies are going to create lots and lots of new jobs that we just don't know what jobs they will be. And some people firmly believe, and they're experts and they have good basis, that technologies is going to destroy lots of jobs. This is something that I and others at the Institute of the Future think about a lot, not because we think that we can predict the future, but we look at signals from outside to help people think about those kind of issues. What is going on with jobs? What's going on with work? Uh, how to think, what frameworks to use for thinking about those things? And there are lots of different techniques that we use, but one of the things we do is we actually, as much historians as we are futurists, we think and we read a lot about history. I don't know how many of you heard this Mark Twain quote. Um, he said that history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And so um, he had lots of quotes, great quotes for every occasion in your life. If you ever need a quote, just look for Mark Twain. But um, if we actually look at history and industrial revolution and other big transformations, the story is kind of the same. Technology does destroy a lot of existing jobs, but it creates lots of new work. But that work is done by a different generation of people, and it's done in a different way. And so if the past is the guide, that's how probably this transformation is going to happen. Now, what's behind that and why I believe that that is the case? So um, you've heard probably a lot of conversations about gig work, on-demand work, however you want to call that, task-based work, and all of these other things like Uber and Lyft. Some people hate it. Some people love it. Um, and uh, what I see is that what we're seeing in, in those kind of gig platforms is they didn't just appear out of nowhere. They didn't just came to life yesterday or the day before yesterday. They're re actually the result of 30 years of us building out certain kind of technology infrastructure that enables this kind of new forms of coordination. And let me explain to you why I think that. If you think about kind of the last 30 years, what have we been building in terms of our technology? First, each generation of these technologies brings with it new capabilities. It allows us to do new kinds of things. So if you think about the internet, email, all of these technologies, what they allowed us to do is to connect beyond our geogra geographic location, beyond organizations. So all of a sudden, you could hire people in many parts of the world, Brazil and US and um, many parts um, in Asia and other places. So it kind of expanded our access. So we saw a lot of subcontracting of work and other kinds of arrangements. Then what do we add to that? What do we bring on top of these technologies? We have basically a generation of mobile technologies, including sensors. Sensors that allow us to sense all kinds of context, including location. So all of a sudden, you have added to that not just connectivity, but context. So I know that you are in a certain location, and I know where you are, maybe what you need, and other kinds of things. And so the l next generation that we're adding to this is basically once everything has sensors and mobile, you get lots and lots of data. 
And that allows you for certain kind of intelligence. So you al it allows you to basically match. You're in this location and you need something and I have something and I can deliver it or somebody has something. So it allows for this kind of new forms of coordination. So what we see kind of emerging, if you think about the gig and all the na names for these economies, we're actually seeing evolution of what we call the digital coordination economy, where a lot of things are being coordinated very efficiently using all of these technologies. And remember, this is 30, years of building out technology infrastructure. So we're not gonna put it back in the box. They're gonna be there. They're just going to be diffusing and evolving. And so when you think about that, what about this coordination economy? If you think about the nature of organizations and what these uh, gig economies, they transform work in a fundamental way. So all of a sudden, it's not about nine to five jobs necessarily, but you can break up those jobs into specific tasks. I need something here at this particular time and somebody can deliver it. So it's around kind of breaking that chronology down. Um, it allows you to reach potentially lots of people who can do things for you, these large networks way beyond the organizations and other um, constraints that you have before. And interestingly enough, probably the most interesting thing is that this kind of coordination is actually done algorithmically. So it's done a lot of times by technologies and not by humans. And if you think about that's why that is important, if you think why we have organizations, why we have companies and all kinds of organizations, there's been a lot of, there have been a lot of economists who wrote about this, but really the reason we have organizations is because they're kind of technology. They're kind of social technology that allows us to coordinate economic activities, right? It allows us to know who is doing, to allocate resources, to coordinate, in complex tasks and other kinds of things. And that's exactly what being disrupted. As a social technology, organizations, many, not all, but a lot of organizations are being disrupted because now we have a new way of coordinating economic activities, of allocating resources, allocating people, finding who needs what, and all of these things. So if you think about, this is uh, one of, right, looks familiar, any of your organizations look like that. This is a technology, it's a social technology, it's the best technology we've built over the last 100 years to coordinate complex tasks and activities. And it sort of worked pretty well for the last 100 years, right? We have theory of scientific management, tons of management books have been written about how to organize and do things efficiently in this way. And suddenly we have Uber and these other gig economies where instead of these massive sort of hierarchical structure, you basically connect people who need something with somebody who can deliver it product or service in a very, very different way. And that is essentially, it's not just about Uber. Increasingly, this is moving into many other aspects of our lives and many kinds of work that we're, we're going to be doing. So one thing to remember, and that's again for history, it seems like it's a huge disruption, right? It's a big, big deal, right? We've always had jobs that we went to nine to five. How could we possibly live without organizing our activities? You know, most of our life revolves around these kinds of jobs. Most of our social networks, most of our meaning in life comes from this. And it, again, history, a little bit of history, comes in handy, which is really the whole, if you think about our whole human experience, 60,000 years um, of human life as we know it, um, it's only the last 300 years that we've had this concept of wage labor as a dominant way of basically obtaining livelihoods. The idea that we can sell our time and our labor as a commodity on the market is a fairly new idea. And for all those thousands of years, it doesn't mean that we were sitting around doing nothing and we're not creating anything. We were creating value, we were doing things, we had social networks, we had meaning in life, all kinds of other things, but we lived in a fundamentally different way. 
And my belief is that we are going, there's going to be lots of work for us to do because every generation of technology creates with it new needs and new desires, and there will be more for us to do than ever before, but we're probably going to be doing it in very, very different ways. We're not going to be doing a lot of it, not all of it probably, not through formal organizations, but a lot of it is going to be done in a very different, this digital coordinated way in, in a very different way. And we're moving through this. It is a big transformation. And we have to think about it. One thing, other thing that we always say about the future, you know, we can't predict the future. And in our work, it's not about predicting the future. It's about imagining possibilities. And what do we need to work on as we are transitioning into this new way of working so it's less painful, so we can transition in with, into it without wars and without major, major disruptions. And as we're moving into this transition, there's a whole range of things we need to think about. One of them is the design of these new platforms, the design of things, of gig platforms and coordination platforms like Uber, that they're not extractive, that they don't just work for people who invest in them and they're um, people who back them financially, but they actually work for people who sustain their livelihoods through those platforms. So we have this whole notion of positive platforms. What are the basic design principles for platforms that work not just for investors, but people who are actually those Uber drivers and others uh, who are basically sustaining their livelihood through these platforms? The other thing, and it's particularly true for the US, probably not for other countries, is that the social safety net that we've developed and built over the last 60 years when we had a lot of auto companies and it was basically designed for large auto manufacturers and, and people who worked and participated in the labor unions and that where all your benefits were tied to your employment, they, don't, they no longer work. They no longer apply into this new environment. I think this is where the countries that have a very different social safety net or actually don't have a social safety net yet have to, they have kind of an advantage in terms of leapfrogging and building something that's suited to the new system rather than the old system. What's a regulatory regime? We need to think about it. How do we regulate this new generation of, of platforms? What do we need to worry about where they don't produce negative social outcomes, but they work really well? And what do we need, maybe, what do we need to stop regulating for? Like, for example, reputations versus certification and licensing. Do we need to be doing certification and licensing when you have uh, really deep sort of reputation systems? I'm not saying you have to, but something to think about. And the other thing is, what's the whole equal, how do we prepare people to live well? What's the whole kind of larger ecosystem of services and skills that people will need to have to live successfully in this new world of work. So that's kind of a little bit of a framework that we're uh, using when we think about work. And as I said, my personal belief is there's gonna be lots of things for us to do, but we're gonna have to do it in a new way. Uh, I think it's transition is a difficult transition. It's probably more difficult for countries like Europe and the US where people already have legacy system that's set up for this old system. I think there's a lot of possibilities for leapfrogging uh, in developing new systems, but these, we need to work on this kind of in a holistic way. Thank you. I'm gonna tease you just a little bit longer and um, it's interesting when I read um, about uh, these ideas of uh, gig economies, et cetera, one of the perspectives I have, and this is probably a bias from where uh, I live, but there does seem to be a very sort of uh, uh, Anglo-American uh, perspective which is put on this topic often. That seems to be a bias that I'm aware of in my inbox. Um, and I'd like to invite Marwa to give a slightly different perspective, a particularly a Middle Eastern perspective, Marwa, but perhaps you could also just give a quick explanation of the work that you do in this context, please. Sure, so I'll, I'll paint a picture of the situation and explain how it relates to our approach at Bamian Media. 
So just to give you a quick overview, so if you probably already know that the Middle East has the highest youth unemployment rate in the world. That means a whole generation is bored, angry, we're frustrated. The Arab Spring was just the tip of the iceberg. In Egypt, the more educated you are, the more likely you are to be unemployed. Gender is also a big issue. A lot of women face discrimination and stigma in the workforce. There's a huge mismatch between the, the, the skills that you acquire in school and those that are required by the modern day job. And also, any business owner's favorite topic of conversation is corruption and bureaucracy <laughs> and the regulatory hurdles. So our show in Egypt was to, um, we promote entrepreneurship. It was called El Mashra, which means the startup. And it was one of the first entrepreneurial TV shows, uh, successful like entrepreneurial TV shows in, in the Middle East. And what we were trying to do is promote this culture of entrepreneurship and um, have our viewers realize their potential. The gig economy in the Middle East, it's, it's, a, it's a promising great start. 40% of Uber drivers were actually unemployed. So I think about 100,000 jobs were created because of Uber. No other like government or, or private sector initiative has, has done anything like that. But it's still relatively in its infancy. We have similar problems like the state and Europe where we don't have um, certain benefits or, or um, this, this, uh, this like security system. But if you talk to the Uber drivers, they really, they really feel like they were exp if they were working as private drivers, they were, more, they were exploited more. But now because of Uber, they're at least paid on time. They can control the hours, their work, because the informal sector in Egypt is huge. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, a, a trillion dollar uh, part of the GDP. So the gig economies are actually helping formalize um, the informal sector in a way. So in a way, it's, it's really helping. And we're already seeing these apps in Egypt um, that are popping out, you know, for also for housekeeping mm -hmm. and things like um, that help with the tasks. So they're helping a lot of people be part of the formalized economy. And um, our approach at Bamia and Media is before we develop any any type of programs is we hold a design lab where we work with different stakeholders because they all have a role to play in unlocking the solution to job creation, the uh, private sector, government, civil society. So we, we do a design lab where we co-create what are the messages that we <coughs> want to get on the show, what <coughs> type of resources do we want to give visibility to. We, we worked with Injez and Dina in promoting a lot of the initiatives that Injez was doing. We also provided uh, great role models and we told an awesome story. So we made sure that we had strong female contestants. Our winner, she was one of, not only is she a great social entrepreneur, she was actually one of the first women in Egypt to take her sexual harasser to court. And what we saw from, we did a study with J-Pal to see what kind of impact we've had on our viewers and we've changed about one million mindsets of our viewers and their opinion of a woman's ability to, to run a business. Uh, and their, um, how they're perceived in the workforce, which was great. But something else that we saw that was what, what wasn't what we were expecting is that our show um, actually, it didn't motivate people to become entrepreneurs because it was so real. Like it was the first time the youth <laughs> had a platform. <laughs> yeah, they were like complaining about the regulatory hurdles and like how the government <laughs> isn't helping us and the banking and like how it's so messed up. They were so real and honest and we didn't censor it. And this was the first time they could actually, you know, talk about it. And we had the largest um, online uh, entrepreneurship community in the Middle East. We had over a million social media followers. So it was their way. Um, they self started to self-organize and create meetups where they trade skills. And it was just something really amazing to see. And at first I was like kind of disappointed, like this wasn't really the plan, but it, but it was so real. And this gives us, this is the, a great start for us to start putting pressure on the government and demanding, you know, certain things. We can't, we can't really, we're talking about fault lines here, but we really can't, you know, it's, as an entrepreneur, we're very innovative in like getting around um, some hurdles. But you know, our role as social entrepreneurs, we always have to balance the short-term urgent needs of today with the long-term needs that are needed to build a better future. So we're, we're very innovative in how to make things work. But our discussion today about job creation for the youth bulge is, is really just a band-aid over the bullet wound. There's so much more that has to be done in order for us to you know, to get past this. And I think the gig economy is playing a huge role in, in a positive way in, in the Middle East.
for a talk for this morning. Dina, can I ask you to respond to Marwa, please? Yeah. So you guys have two Middle Eastern girls on the panel <laughs> today. <laughs> so you can see a lot going on in our part of the world. So there's no doubt that there is this wave of change happening with young people at the forefront. Uh, and they're creating disruption throughout, um, you know, th throughout various areas that we're seeing in our societies. And nowhere are we feeling that more prevalent than in our part of the world in the Middle East. Um, I'm sure you've all witnessed what was happening back in 2011 with the revolution and the unsettling political waves of change that were happening in our region. But what was not being shed light on is another type of change that was taking form, which is this unreal entrepreneurial movement that was, is happening throughout the Middle East and especially in Egypt. Um, where, where young people were no longer going to wait around you know, for a government job or, or f to seek out employment. But a paradigm shift was happening where young people started to take their future into their own hand and create their own economic opportunity. Now, our organization in jazz has been working with young people for over 15 years now in the Middle East and in Egypt, um, uh, promoting through de delivering different programs on entrepreneurship, work readiness skills, financial literacy, you're integrating these uh, skills and this kind of mindset at a very young age with middle school students and then with high school students and growing up with, you, with them into university. And so over a decade, we had empowered half a million uh, young people uh, throughout Egypt and, uh, and in the Middle East, even over a million uh, young people with these kinds of skills and mindsets. And uh, what we found was this, uh, this immense movement and um, uh, love for entrepreneurship with young people. And it really started to take form uh, around the time of uh, the revolution that you witnessed in Egypt. And that just took off. And uh, we found so many young people creating different kinds of businesses in different areas, uh, whether it was tech, whether it was renewable energy, whether they were um, uh, creating social impact. And what was beautiful to see was the, that they, became, they would become role models for their peers. So we'd have uh, someone starting up an amazing uh, e-waste recycling business out of a small town in, in Tanta. And he'd make it and he'd have a successful business and uh, uh, his peers would aspire to be like him. And again, think of starting their own small business and it just created this momentum with young people uh, having other uh, role models as young entrepreneurs. And it just kept going and we kept seeing how uh, so many of these young entrepreneurs not only were role models, uh, for their peers, but became change makers. And, and we're going to see this more and more happening across the world, where young people through entrepreneurship and through social entrepreneurship are going to be able to take on the various challenges uh, that we face as societies and through their businesses come up with, uh, with successful ways to address and create change. So no doubt, through entrepreneurship, we're going to be seeing a young generation coming forward, uh, becoming change makers in this world through entrepreneurship. Great, thanks very much. And what's your perspective from Kenya? Thank you so much, Rose. And uh, mine is no different from, from Marwa and Rose because uh, actually the issue of the gig economy and this shifting landscape is also what we are experiencing. Probably you may not be aware that uh, South Southern Hemisphere, majorly Sub-Saharan Africa, has one of the largest employment rates in the world. Using an example of my country, Kenya, we have over 40% unemployment rate of the youth. And that one is a disturbing statistic, which actually, if we don't respond to the urgency of the time, it is a crisis in the brewing. <coughs> we have also taken advantage of the gig economy because as you talked about Uber, Uber has also created quite a number of jobs for uh, our youths who actually were created into the circular system that you go to school, you get the skill, then you get a job. But then these jobs are shrinking each and every passing day because of automation. 
and artificial intelligence, we are having now to reduce that workspace, sort of expanding it actually to meet the rising demands. That is why we have, as youth, responded to the need to embrace entrepreneurship as a solution to this problem. Like if most of you might have taken interest or curiosity to find out what goes on in Kenya because it's one of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa that you find quite a lot of activities, be it youth activism, response to technology. Like we have M-Pesa that is actually one of the successful stories in the world in terms of, 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 of mobile banking. And we have also been able to replicate such models like we have m Copper that is currently being championed by the same company M-Pesa in which they're trying to use technology to promote access to energy as, as a strategy to spur entrepreneurship. Because you all know that without energy, it is technically not possible actually to spur economic growth. Because even the technology we are talking about itself is fueled by energy. And that's why it is a lot of activities going on in that sector. We have also taken interest, like in my company, we have one. M, M, M Soma Institute trying to develop a model along M, M Pesa in which we are trying to scale up the use of technical skills to create employment for the youths. What we do, we have realized that there is this group of youths who cannot afford to access the current education models in which they say that after finishing high school, you have to do a, either diploma, which is a three year training, or a degree which is a four to five year training, training and most of them either cannot afford or essentially even if you moved on and went on to do something like business management, the issue is this, are there those jobs? So we came up with a model of training youths for short time skills like someone just wants a technical skill to be an electrician, someone wants to be, to be an IT expert specializing in basics like network cabling. Some ones want to special in basic skills like web development. And that is why we have come up to promote access to such skills by simply making it accessible. We offer, we subsidize the cost, and to some extent we offer full scholarship to those vulnerable youths who are yearning for the skill, to get the skill to earn a living and make their life meaningful. I also focus on, uh, they, they have uh, also run another company called Disa Energy Management. At this energy management, we focus on enriched groups in that part of the world. It is quite, quite disturbing statistics in this era because when you look at a country like the little Burundi and South Sudan, no more than 2% of the population have an access to electricity. And when you are talking about creating opportunities for the youths, talking about creating economic emancipation of the people, then you could sound a little bit arrogant if you will be talking about such parts of the world without talking about how can we develop models that can promote access to electricity. In Kenya, compared to the region, there has been a significant effort in which, as we speak today, close to 50% of the population can access electricity. But because of the large population in the rural setting, we still have quite a lot to do. And these youths are coming from all these parts of the world. The question is, how can we tap them into the entrepreneurial spirit that we are trying to champion? At DESA Energy Management, we focus on looking at renewable discrete models that we can use to promote access to energy. Some of them involve the change of mindset. People have not known that actually solar has become such cheap that is <coughs> actually cheaper than using these diesel generators. So what we are doing is using consumer education to promote understanding of the capabilities of these models and focusing on optimal design to install them at small scale because with energy, a person can be able to run a small business enterprise in a village. You can't run a small kiosk selling sugar and salt beyond seven in the evening if you cannot have electricity in that, pl that place. You sometimes looking at access to the internet to be able to take advantage of the gig economy in which you can be able to take a contract online from the United States and be able to complete and submit. And if you cannot have an access to electricity, you are actually cut off from the rest of the world. Essentially, that's what we are doing at this Energy Management and MSOMA Institute. Thank Great. you. Thanks very much.
it's very interesting to get the perspective which is not just an Anglo-American perspective. It's also interesting to hear you all talk about uh, entrepreneurship as being a key uh, uh, driver for your work. It's also interesting to hear that you, although you talk about the development of technical skills and entrepreneurial skills <coughs> in conversations we've had uh, prior to this meeting, it's also very clear that it's yes. not just about entrepreneurship to make money. There's a yes. kind of a social and a, a social dimension to the focus of your work. Um, so lots of uh, fodder for thought. And I think it might be a good idea if we now get into a discussion and perhaps take some of the questions that you've, uh, uh, that you've been working on. Uh, and again, if we can just make sure we uh, use the mic, please. So I'm tweeting and people from South Africa are responding and saying, this all sounds amazing, but you know, 80% of the children in our country can't read at grade level. So if you can't read for meaning in grade six, how the heck are you ever going to get access and benefit? So the inequality is in your face, especially in a room like this, because there's so many people in sub-Saharan Africa who would never benefit from this until we, unless we do something about it. So for me, that's the real, uh, we, we get excited about all these things and then there's the reality in, in, our, our, um, in, in places like Africa. And, and we have to find solutions at the same time for both these groups of people. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, my name is Tom Rainsworth. I run an organization called Enabling Enterprise. And what we do in the UK is help uh, schools to embed basic skills into the curriculum. Um, and I think that's something that's been alluded to a couple of times. So, um, Marina, you mentioned sort of towards the end some of the skills that young people might need. A couple of the other speakers mentioned as well other skills beyond sort of entrepreneurial skills or financial literacy skills. Um, so I'm interested, uh, we have a set of skills that we see as being important in the UK context, which is around interpersonal skills, communication skills, creative problem solving and self-management. And I'm really interested if that uh, is a set of skills that resonates in other settings and also whether you see the approach of embedding those uh, as a discrete subject uh, across the curriculum as we do in the UK is something that again would translate into different context. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take a few questions um, and then we'll see if there are themes emerging. <coughs> can't see that far at the back, so if you um, shout. Thank you. Noah Manduk from Durable Good. So there's an underlying thesis from, from all of the panelists, which is, Marina, to borrow another American proverb, that necessity is the mother of invention, uh, and, and hence the birth of this new age of entrepreneurship. I was really surprised and heartened to hear from the Middle East panelists that the educational systems in the Middle East is adapting as well, that the market forces are causing, as early as you suggested, middle school where children are learning the skills that will help them to adapt to this gig economy. The absolute opposite is true in North America. The American educational system is stuck and is not spitting out a population with 21st century skills to ready them for entrepreneurship. And I'm just wondering <coughs> if you could comment from a Middle East perspective what market forces were able to penetrate the educational system and what can the North learn uh, from those dynamics because we are stuck. Oh, thank, thank, thank you very you. much. Uh, at the back, please. Let's take two more questions and then we'll... Uh... I'm Shonali Khan and I work with Breakthrough in India. So actually you really uh, said my question because in India we have the same challenge that the education system is not able to keep a pace with the changing times and we are uh, sort of uh, creating young people who then have very conventional degrees and then not being able to cope with reality and need uh, not just basic degrees but subsequent degrees uh, to even get a good job. So that was very much in the same way and so it's not just a North American problem. The second, actually the second question what I wanted to talk about that this has created a lot of instability in the, in not just the economy but the lives of people. So. I think there is a lot of virtue in saying that it's very dynamic, it's very fluid, it gives a lot of opportunities, but it's also created instability, lots of tension, and for young people uh, who are 
very aspirational. Sometimes those aspirations are not met. And I think uh, yesterday, Dr. J uh, uh, Jim Kim also spoke about that there is the surge in aspirations, which if unfulfilled, will result in a lot of anxiety. And I think this is particularly true of young people. So I'd like to hear the views of the panelists on these two points. Let's say just one more question for now, and then we'll come back. Um, there's a gentleman at the, at the very back. I think had his hand up early. <coughs> Thank you, David Jones from Microsoft. I also think about the future of work. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of benefits to be gained from some of these new digital platforms. On the flip side, uh, we sometimes see um, as you move, as you digitize part of the economy, you move the income distribution from a more normal distribution curve to a more power curve, exacerbating income inequality. I'm wondering if you have any uh, concrete suggestions, thoughts on what we could do to uh, address that problem. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, could we start with that last question? And Marina, would you like to offer a, <coughs> a response? Uh, yes, absolutely. I, I wouldn't say that all of the income inequality in the U.S. is a result of these kinds of gig platforms. It's a 30-year sort of development that we're seeing. But clearly, in some ways, it's uh, exacerbating that. Um, you know, what there's kind of new approaches. There's a uh, platform co-ops that are being created. So now there are alternatives to Uber popping up in Austin, New York, that are actually worker-owned. I really believe that we need to start thinking about kind of asset buildup and asset, you know, people have been talking about universal basic income, but I think we might have to start talking about universal basic assets and how do you build up those assets in the individual level. I don't think it's just about platforms. I think it's that whole ecosystem. And coming back to the issue of instability in all of that, yes, there is a lot of risks that's been moved to individuals in this new way. Now, young people who are coming it, they didn't know it any other way. This is like reality that they're growing up with. This is how, th this is what work is to them. But there is a real issue of risk and instability in all of these platforms. And I do think there is a role for government in thinking about what, how do you minimize those risks or how, what's the social safety net like in the US, you, uh, there's no benefits that are associated with working in the gig economy. You know, there's now uh, proposals for portable benefits where you can basically accrue benefits, doesn't matter what platform you work on. So um, I, I don't think it's a, there's, there are parts, it's like the whole ecosystem is shifting. So there is a role for government, there is a role for, um, platforms themselves. There are new ownership models for platforms that I think we need to be supporting to, to minimize some of the income inequality. And with all of that, there are other issues. There are taxes and all, in, if, it, if you're talking about in, in the US, it's a, like a whole, it's not one solution. It's a whole ecosystem of solutions that are needed. But I think if we kind of approach it from the point of view that this is the new way of working for a lot of people. This is the reality and we actually need to be focusing on building those new solutions and designing new solutions. You know, it will probably take us five to 10 years to implement them, but we need to start doing it now because it's already creating a lot of social issues in the economy. I also want to say something about education and kind of, I, I, I agree with you that most of the education in establishment in, in a lot of places, I mean, if you go to career services in most uh, uh, colleges, universities, they, uh, yeah, they, they don't work, they don't even understand this reality. However, uh, I think there are some interesting things happening. Actually, community college systems, like we're working with the California community college system, where they're looking at the whole concept of learning and er is earning, where you actually, while you're in college, you can actually learn reputation, how to build reputations, and you can be working on some of these platforms and that's counted as your credentials. In some ways, community college system, which is kind of a second tier system in the US that's oftentimes overlooked uh, and underappreciated, but it's very extensive, particularly mm -hmm. in California, uh, because of the population they're serving and their openness, they're much better prepared and actually are doing some interesting things. Not across <laughs> the board, but yes, doing some really interesting things. 
just before we come back to the educational questions that arose, I'd just like to ask Dina, what's your perspective on this idea of income inequality and instability that might be coming about through this shift in economic and uh, workplace uh, contexts? Yeah, it's something definitely that we have to address early on that will again bring us back to the education part. Um, uh, just like addressing some of the questions that were posed. Um, uh, being able to uh, sort of integrate global programs and ironically that we're taking from the North uh, on financial literacy, work readiness skills, entrepreneurship. And we've had to actually with, with government, our uh, education system is still stuck in the past century, if not the century before it. <laughs> Um, so we've really had to impose ourselves and, uh, and sort of really, you know, build up this relationship of trust, trust with our Ministry of Education to kind of in integrate these kinds of global programs that have been Arabized and Egyptianized into the school system as an extracurricular ex activity. Because we can't wait for the government and the Ministry of Education to create reforms, and then we w wait another couple of decades for these reforms to take place, and already we were two generations out. Um, so we need to instigate change today. And so the way um, we're trying to do that in our country and across the Middle East is integrate these new programs and concepts <laughs> Um, into even an extracurricular activity throughout the school day where volunteers from the private sector come in and actually teach these programs to school children. And why do we use private sector volunteers? A, it creates this link between you know, the working world and uh, the schooling system. And B, um, it creates a great kind of link as that volunteer becomes a role model to these students, talks to them about you know, um, uh, the world he's coming from here, she is coming from, and is able to equip them with these kinds of skills and mindsets. And what's wonderful is that it's created this wonderful link and bond between volunteer and the student that has lasted uh, even till that student graduated from uh, university and that volunteer continues to become their mentor and serve as that, their mentor. And it really creates that kind of <coughs> paradigm shift and uh, mindset change and uh, can allow that student to later either work in the same company or work elsewhere, but he has that he or she has that mentor as a support. So you're effectively working through the schooling system yes. currently. And Marwa, you're working in many ways alongside mm -hmm. the schooling system. Yeah, like I couldn't agree more. Our schooling system is it's a disaster. <laughs> and uh, I think a big part of it is also like our parents play like a huge role in what we study. They're like, be an engineer, be a doctor, you know, go work for the public sector. But the problem is these jobs don't exist anymore. And if they do, they don't come with the same type of benefits that they used to. So like we have to explain to our parents that the reason we're still bachelors and bachelorettes has nothing to do with like not getting like a bachelor <laughs> of science degree. Like it's really not related to, to our degree at all. <laughs> but so uh, what we do is we're changing the mindset. So our show is not only for, for the youth. A lot of the messages we integrated in our TV show is actually for the parents who are, who are watching. You know, we're not really, um, you, we're not really, you know, failure is not accepted in our society. It's not something that, you know, we're taught in school or taking risks and all of these things that aren't really part of our educational system. We have to, like, memorize and then spit out the information. So there's not a lot of, like, analytic skills and, and critical thinking and there's no career system or, like, you know, career advisors or counselors when you're graduating from college. So what we're doing is uh, really focusing on changing the mindset and behaviors that might lead to job creation, and also working with the different schools and, and the ecosystem in Egypt. So just like we do organic brand integration for the private sector, we had Samsung as our main sponsor, we also did organic brand integration for the ecosystem so that um, the viewers at home know what are the resources available in Egypt, what are the accelerators, what are the incubators. <coughs> and I think the best lesson that we, we promote in our show, Al Mashrua, the tagline was realize your potential. And I think that was the best message that we, we got across is how our contestants really, like they, I, they we're really up against difficult challenges, but they never gave up hope and they really, um, they really tried their best and never gave up. So this 
you know, after the Arab Spring, like, what, what did we accomplish? We're back at square one. Like, you know, like, it, we're actually worse <laughs> off now with the, d so, uh, like, but it's still, like, really important to be optimistic and have this, and that's what's really amazing about the entrepreneurs and the youth in general in the Arab world, despite how bad our educational system is, they're so, they're, they're so innovative, they're so, like, they know where to get information. We have amazing social entrepreneurs who, like Nefham in Egypt, who are creating these online learning platforms and they're able to get their resources from somewhere else and, you know, building their own source of resilience and hope from, from basically scratch in some situations, like. That's great, thanks. Yeah. Ozil, do you work, to what extent do you work through the education system or alongside or entirely outside? Actually, we have a multifaceted approach because we build on existing education system at the same time we are working parallel to it. And there is a sense in which I believe the government has been able to make a response to the models that have been built by the frustrated youths working along it. I'm sure that uh, if you check any random online statistic data, you should be able to realize <coughs> Kenya is one of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa with the highest trained labor force that has been untapped. And over time, this group of youths were tapped into activism. And uh, when they realized that it could not work, they actually developed parallel options. Like a few years ago, we tried to come with a model like what we have uh, the, that give birth to the current Silicon Valley. We call it uh, iHub in which tech savvy youths came together to see can we create a space that will serve as an incubation center to inject technical <coughs> yet practical skills in the youths that can make them be relevant out there without going through the education models like what she's talked about in which you are trained to go through a piped system, cram, pass exam, then there's a job waiting for you out there. I went through the same, I did a Bachelor of, Engineer, Bachelor of Science Engineering Electrical <laughs> I was waiting for the same, I didn't see anything. I changed that name a little bit to do Bachelor of Engineering now in electrical, the same. There was nothing coming out of it. I did Masters of Engineering and I'm realizing that the system keeps extending my stay in school, but it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't grant this promise of this job. And it is from that that we realize that we have to create parallel systems with the government that are practical, that will make us have meaning. And I'm happy that in the recent past, just the onset of this year, we saw our Ministry of Education partner with MasterCard Foundation in support of German Development Bank announcing a large-scale program of shifting attention from this piped system to impacting youth through short-term skills that are entrepreneurial and that can help these youths have meaning mm -hmm. in life. And I believe such models can be scaled that when we take it upon ourselves to take actions sometimes a stiff naked system can respond. Yes. Great, thank you very much. Yeah. Can we take a few more questions, please? The gentleman here. Hello, my name is Nox and I'm <coughs> from Senegal. Uh, I have a little issue with all this talk about entrepreneurship because yes, it's, it's something that we should strive for and obviously the North has um, made it such a, a beautiful thing, let's all be like Mark Zuckerberg, let's all be an entrepreneur, but not everybody is a winner, not everybody has it in them. What about staying in rural areas and working on your parents' farm? You know, these are big, important issues, you know, urbanization, especially on the African continent, is, is a disaster. And so, I mean, what about just going back, maybe you touched on universal basic income, what about learning how to be happy? <laughs> I know it sounds a little bit crazy, but not everybody is going to be able to fit into, you know, an entrepreneurial activity or into the formal job market that's going to be cannibalized by automation. Thank you very much. <coughs> the lady here, in row two. Hi, my name is Marlou and I lead an organization called World Merit. And in line with the conversation we have today and some stuff that we heard yesterday, um, we try to build confidence in young people from all over the world so that they raise their aspiration and then we meet that aspiration with opportunity. So um, basically we're trying to gamify social action to give points for acts of merit um, and then allow people to make themselves eligible and have access to different opportunities. And 
what I'm really interested in is what is the shift in paradigm or what is the revolution that needs to take place in the world of recruitment to move to that stage of sustainable recruitment where we can acknowledge and celebrate the skills that we just talked about that are not being taught in school yet, um, but that are definitely important to, to move the, f the world to a place where we want it to be. Thank you very much. Uh, this lady on row three, please. My name is Rebecca, I'm from the African Management Initiative and we're working on a scalable approach to um, workplace learning in Africa. Um, it's really interesting to hear the kind of consensus around the types of skills that are needed from these very different markets, you know, from the States, Kenya, Egypt, all talking about transferable skills, 21st century skills, these kind of life skills. I'm really interested in examples either from the panel or the audience of models that have worked in developing these skills. Mm -hmm. I mean that your stories of entrepreneurship are really interesting, but these kind of specific skills and to, to your point about then once you've developed them, how do you identify them and kind of use them in a recruitment context? So any practical examples of developing these new 21st century skills and then I guess linked with kind of how you make that work in a job match matching context as well. Okay, okay. Two more, this gentleman here. And then gentleman. Ruskin Hartley with Fairtrade USA. So we work with a lot of entrepreneurial farmers around the world. And it, it kind of strikes me in the same way that we sort of disaggregated our commodity markets and pushed all the risk down to the small producers. We're kind of doing the same thing now with the rest of the workforce. So I'm curious about people's thoughts about how we kind of bypass the last 100 uncomfortable years in the commodity markets and really move towards creating that shared value model uh, moving forward and, and not just saying, well, there's a few platforms out here that kind of have a cooperative structure. How do we really make this work for everyone along these new sort of value chains that are being created? Thank you. Last question. Uh, gentleman up there, please. <coughs> I'm Matthias Wackernagel with Global Footprint Network. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting panel. Marina said something interesting in the beginning, kind of looking into the future about being able to see possibilities. You may not be able to predict the future. Still, there are some big mega trends that we know about. Two I li would like to mention. If you want to comply <coughs> with Paris, we should be out of fossil fuel use by 2050. Uh, most people alive today will be alive in 2050. And uh, so, Putting that, or if you're ha if you're lucky, <laughs> so so putting that context out, then I think rather than just reacting to what's happening now, I think it may help us to give more of a perspective and also more agency for young people to say what kind of a world do we need, what kind of jobs will be needed in the future, where do we need to put our investment? Because I think now it's just kind of a sense of we just react to what is right now rather than getting a sense for youth that actually they will be the peak professionals by 2050 and so, so what kind of a world do they want to create and have a bit more long-term perspective. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'm very conscious of time, so we'll, tr we'll have to keep this uh, quite quick, I think. But again, let's start with this theme, I think, which then connects to this idea of work for what, uh, which might be work for happiness or work for purpose or meaning, and certainly work for a better world, I think. Marina, would you like to take that question, the hardest question? Yeah, it's a really hard question because, you know, I'm just coming out, I'm, I, I was just in Iceland for this weekend working with people there and they just introduced a bill in Parliament to teach philosophy mandatory uh, in all high school in at uh, school level and I, I love that. I really believe that we need like to think about giving people ability to think and create meaning and understand and all of these things that are not skill-based, that specific skill, because first of all, it's really hard to predict what jobs will be in the future. So I am totally with you. I'm for just liberal arts, good, solid education that is about how do you live a good life, you know, independent of that. You can get skills and there are plenty of places that, and I, I believe in that. The other thing I also want to say is that this notion, we have this kind of notion of an entrepreneur as this heroic, you know, Mark Zuckerberg or Bill Gates who go out and they get VC money and they build these giant enterprises. 
Um, and the people, a lot of people who are working in these kind of on demand or ad hoc, they're not that, and they don't want to be that, and they don't need to be that. And, and so when we think about entrepreneurship, I, I do believe that there's a lot of skills that people need to live in this world. Like for example, one of the skills that people need is to actually understand, is it worth it for me to work this hour? What am I actually getting as opposed to what's the cost of my time? These kind of analytical things, a lot of people don't realize, well, yeah, I get this money, but if I have to pay for this and that, and it's really not worth it. You know, those kind of financial skills, skills on self-management, skills on getting, you know, all kinds of things. Um, and so it's, it's not about just that kind of entrepreneurship. Yeah, and I think just to jump in there, there is this, I think, uh, slightly unhelpful idea of entrepreneurship um, that pervades in many places. And I'm conscious, actually, the way you guys use it is much softer, isn't it? It's about someone being entrepreneurial, having the skills to it's make like we need a new term for it. To create, yeah. et cetera. And, and I wonder, Mo, if you might just embellish that idea a little bit, because you were explaining mm -hmm. that when you, uh, in some of your work, uh, entrepreneurs are engaging in social objectives. It's not just entrepreneurialism to make money. Yeah, so in our like. show, like, part of the reason we, we did the show is to create these role models, but we didn't want to create these, you know, the, the typical type of entrepreneurial role models, you know. Um, so we, we had one of our contestants, he didn't even graduate from high school, but he was very resourceful and he had these other skills. One of our contestants was a farmer, and he, uh, another contestant was a social entrepreneur doing re renewable energy. So we were trying to promote different types of entrepreneurship, but it wasn't just our show wasn't just about entrepreneurship. Like you said, like being happy is really important. Like to have like meaning and purpose, and to sometimes you can't change the situation that you're in, so you're forced to like change to change it. So this is what's happened. This is like being an entrepreneur. You're changing the situation and you're, you're, you're changing the future, you're changing the economy, you're making your own jobs and it's something that we have to do together. It's not one person or it's not affecting just the entrepreneur, it's affecting society. So a big part of our show was creating these role models but real people that you can really relate to that, you know, that failed on national TV, that got, you know, humiliated by their teammates but they picked themselves up again and they tried again. You, the best part of being an entrepreneur is like how many times we fail and how we learn from our failure and you know taking another stab stab at it. So those are some Indeed. of the lessons. Yeah, so just building on what Mar was saying, again, let's not get stuck on the term entrepreneur, but I understand what you're saying that uh, a lot of young people now want a sense of purpose in whatever it is they're doing, whether they're working in a corporate, whether they're doing their own business and at the end of the day, what we're really focused on is creating change makers on the ground. So we can w find a lot of our, uh, uh, our startups that we support are working with farmers who, who end up, let's say one example, who burn rice husks every season and create a lot of pollution in the environment and a group of, uh, uh, of that one startup would take these rice husks and turn them into uh, you know, decorative uh, material that they'd end up selling to places like Ikea and things like that. So it's, it's that mindset that you're, you don't have to be in a, creating a huge corporate, but you can be creating a small level of change in, within your community, within your society that will, will resonate. And that's what we're really trying to encourage is uh, for, for this young generation to be led uh, by with purpose, to have the, the skills, the leadership skills and mentality uh, to create, to become the change makers in their societies at the end of the day. Great. Fazil, what's your perspective? It can actually not be said better than she's put it. <laughs> and uh, responding to what he said is that uh, actually happiness is the highest pursuit of human endeavor and uh, in any case we do what we do so that we may be happy and essentially when you have needs not met sometimes that pursuit is uh, in jeopardy and uh, 
what we focus on and a much broader understanding of entrepreneurship starts with self that can you be able to be creative in a way that you can meet your own need then extending from that can you be able to involve and engage yourself in a manner that can also change people around you sometimes just change the mindset that we can all seek our own personal solutions talking about from your perspective farming yes you can work on your father's farm that is entrepreneurial because someone is thinking of going to wait for an office job but you after finishing your school you are working on the farm and by doing that you are meeting not only your personal need but also meeting the needs of others i've been able to meet a few other youths on this program out here who are actually coming from an agricultural perspective i think i saw others from kenya called farm drive and attending this and i have seen those youths actually in a unique way be able to meet their own needs and be able to meet the needs of the entire society in a way that is amazing. Personally, I do farming. I should confess this. I do farming at a small scale, meeting garden farming. I do it for purposes of meeting my needs, also meeting the needs of the community. As we speak today, most of you must be aware that we are having a chilling a chilling drought in uh, East Africa for the last four months we've not had rainfall people have not been able to produce crops but I've been able to reach tomatoes during dry season farming through irrigation farming and from it I'm able to meet my needs and maybe also to supply the crop at a time in which is in scarce supply to the market essentially that the spirit of entrepreneur being able to meet your personal needs as well extending the same spirit to meet the needs of others so yeah. this kind of entrepreneur, this change maker, is somebody yes. who is taking the lead, who is being empathic, I think, with others yes. and with uh, towards the w needs of the world, is working with others to come up with positive solutions. And it seems to me that that kind of person yes. contrasts starkly with the kind of focus we have in education systems, which are essentially created to... Uh, for compliance yeah. and following the rules and repetition, yes. uh, which is not what we need now. Um, yeah. And it seems to me that the huge fault line here is in that disjoint between what education systems are doing and what we need in the world of work and what young people uh, are moving into in the world. We've run out of time, I'm afraid. I'm very conscious that we didn't uh, answer two questions. I'm going to try to answer one of the questions. One of the questions I think we might struggle with is on uh, this ki the kind of recruitment intermediary space, which is definitely worthy of a conversation. I actually quite like to have that conversation with you outside of this room. The other question is what models exist that are effective at nurturing uh, change makers, this kind of entrepreneur? And I wonder if we might just do a very quick poll to end and to ask who in this room um, actually is running a model that is effectively developing uh, change makers. And I think you three guys should first of all put your hand up. Mm -hmm. Who else in the room is providing programs that are effective at developing? So I would suggest you have a meeting with every one of those people <laughs> at some point yeah. in the next 30 minutes. Uh, there are lots of examples. I don't quite know how best to capture those examples. Some one needs to do that, I think. Thank you very much. One very final thing. Could you please, please fill out your survey form? And thank you very much for your time. Thank you.